for me, if, um, if you look at the bottom of your screen, there's a little uh, icon that says reactions. Um, and if you press that, you can see uh, like a hands up. Thumbs up. So uh, if we ask a question, okay, great, Jane, Jane found it. <laughs> very good, very good. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, the New Knowledge Adventures uh, presentation of Birds of Baja California. My name is Lisa Artiga, and I'm an NKA volunteer. I uh, just want to give you a very quick background on New Knowledge Adventures, because we have quite an interesting history. Over 15 years ago, a group of volunteers came together to create a lifelong learning program in Pocatello, Idaho. And the volunteers looked at uh, affordable access, volunteer governance, volunteer instructors, and active engagement of the community as the foundations for their program. In 2014, AARP, Idaho State University, and uh, the Treasure Valley YMCA partner to bring NKA to the Treasure Valley. And we have been very active since offering um, at least 40 classes each semester. This year, because of the pandemic, we are offering only online classes and we're delighted that we can do that because we are the only NKA group in Idaho offering online access to classes. I want to emphasize that NKA is volunteer driven. Our instructors, presenters are volunteers, our facilitators are volunteers, um, our curriculum committee of which uh, Steve Ledbetter is the chair. Um, it's all volunteer and we're um, very proud to be part of that. Uh, before I introduce the speaker, I want everyone to be familiar with the Zoom uh, icons at the bottom of your screen. There is a chat icon, and if you click on the chat icon, you will see that it allows you to type a question into the chat box. So anytime during the presentation that you wish to ask a question, just type it in there and I will interrupt the speaker and have him answer your question. Also in that chat box, Steve is going to put a link for the survey. We really appreciate your feedback because this is a new experience for all of us. Uh, and uh, we always welcome your input and your suggestions for doing this better. Uh, anything you would like to uh, add, um, please feel free to do so. So Steve, is there anything else you wanna add about the survey? No, I, I, will, I will share it uh, on the screen at the end too, so it's a little bit bigger than in the chat box, right okay. after you, you know, as you're finishing up. Okay, great. So now we're going to, um, I'm going to begin by introducing our speaker. Our speaker today is Alexander Sapiens. Uh, he's an emeritus professor from San Jose State University. And when he retired in 2009, he decided that bird watching would be a good hobby to keep his mind sharp and get him out in the great outdoors. And that hobby actually grew into a passion that has taken him birding to five continents and numerous countries in Asia, Europe, Central America, South America, throughout the US, Canada, and New Zealand. He currently serves on the board of the Golden Eagle Audubon Society and is a member of the Southwest Idaho Birders Association. Uh, Alexander enjoys sharing his knowledge with others and has given numerous presentations on the birds of uh, countries he has visited or of his favorite birding spots. And uh, needless to say, one of his favorite birding spots besides Cabo in Mexico is right here in the Treasure Valley. So without further ado, Alexander, you can go ahead and start your presentation. Okay. Let's see if we can get the show on the road. Okay, so this is uh, limited to birds of Baja California Sur. So we're gonna be looking at the 
southern part of Baja California. And if you look at this map, you can see that um, the peninsula of Baja California is like we a big You cannot see the map, Alex. You can't cannot. see the map? No. You're not seeing this. I'm not seeing anything other than your face. You need chair screen. Not sharing the screen. Oh. Okay, share screen. Okay, can you see that, Steve? Yeah, maybe go to the next page. Okay, so we're going to be focused primarily on the bottom part or the southernmost part of Baja California Sur and it's like a large sock and uh, primarily the cities that I'll be looking at are Cabo San Lucas and San Jose del Cabo but we all I've also birded and there'll be pictures from places like Todos Santos, La Paz and then uh, Los uh, Barriles you know, all the way back. But mostly, uh, my favorite spots are right here in San Jose del Cabo. It's a great birding spot because uh, this is all desert, but there are certain places that have water, year round water, and uh, besides the ocean. And uh, that's primarily uh, San Jose del Cabo and Todos Santos. And so, um, but when uh, Lisa and I first started birding or coming here, maybe 15 years ago, uh, this was a two way road between Cabo San Lucas here and San Jose del Cabo. But now this whole corridor has filled in with resorts which has actually impacted the, the uh, habitat for birds. Now our favorite place is Punta Ballena and we always stay at Hacienda Encantada right here. And uh, which is really quite close to Cabo San Lucas. And uh, I would highly recommend that particular resort. And uh, and then over in this area, they, they actually have a, um, a uh, couple of grocery stores like uh, Walgreens and uh, Costco. So uh, I've got a lot of bird pictures, so I'm gonna be going through them fairly quickly. Okay, so, uh, and these are the main places that I'll be looking at as Estero San Jose, Hacienda Encantada, Los Cabos Golf Resort, Cabo San Lucas, Todos Santos, and La Paz. And uh, this is actually the, the beach at Estero San Jose. And that's actually the place, and this is the, the Sea of Cortez back here. And then they, they run horses on this beach. And you can see the, the small birds actually, if it gets windy, will get down into these little divots created by the horses. And um, so they have this, this estero or, or uh, it's not really a river to speak of, but it's a uh, body of water and, and there's a trail along the body of water. And so you can see the birds very closely, you get quite close. And, um, and the birds also like the coots will get right up on the pathway and come right back off again. And when we first started, if you see all, all of this uh, greenery, you used to be on both sides of the of the waterway, but to accommodate tourists, 
they cut out all the the habitat on on the tourist side, if you will, so you can easily see. And then this is Hacienda Encantada and their rocky little beach. And, uh, and you can see it more from this is looking northeast of Hacienda Encantada. And uh, this is looking uh, due north. And uh, they also, uh, on Fridays, you can go horseback riding. And so that's Lisa on a horse. And uh, here's some of the cacti up close. They have a lot of cactus. And um, one thing uh, Lisa pointed out is that I didn't mention that estero in Spanish means estuary. And you can also see uh, whale watching up close. You can see it right from our hotel room. And uh, this is a sea lion who is climbed up on the back of the boat. And this guy actually will reach into his cooler right here and you know, take out a fish and give it to the fish, to the sea lion. And so these sea lions, which are actually quite large, will uh, have a snack. And of course, behind that sea lion is a brown pelican, and he's looking for a snack as well. Okay, so that was San Lucas. And you can see over here, there's uh, usually on Wednesdays, there'll be two or three uh, cruise ships that'll come in. And this is Milano Beach. Very sandy beach, um, very popular. And um, now I'm gonna go into the endemic birds. The endemic birds are the birds that only occur there. And it's the Belvin's yellowthroat, the gray thrasher, and the Xanthusis hummingbird. So this is the Belvin's yellowthroat. And uh, this one is very similar to uh, the common yellow throat that we have here. It's slightly larger. And uh, in fact, this one actually might be a common yellow throat because the eyebrow is more yellow than the building's yellow throat. And this is a gray thrasher. And I really like this particular bird because the, uh, the spots on its breast actually are like little triangles pointing upward, as you can see. And it's the only uh, thrasher that has that. And it usually gets down on the ground and, and thrashes through the leaves and stuff on the ground. And this is the male Xanthusis hummingbird. And uh, it's uh, quite small, but it's bigger than, uh, than our smallest hummingbird. The Xanthusis hummingbird. We only get two hummingbirds, and those are Costa's hummingbird and the Xanthusis. Now we'll go into seabirds, and they have a lot of magnificent frigate birds. And this has become one of my favorite birds because these birds rarely land. They are prominent. I would say they spend 99% of their time in the air. And they're unique in that this particular bird can shut off half its brain. And so half of the brain, half of the bird is sleeping in the air while the other half is awake. It seems weird. And, and this is the male and it, he can really puff up this red pouch here. And uh, they're kind of a parasitic bird. They'll steal fish from other birds. And uh, this is a female, another female. And then this is one of the rare shots that I've found where you have a pair of them actually landing somewhere. And then uh, cormorants, the two most common cormorants, first one being the Brant's cormorant, smaller dark cormorant, and it has a blue throat. You can really see it right here. 
And uh, the most common cormorant is the double crested. We get those here in, in Idaho. And uh, those cormorants are, are uh, basically fish eating birds and they get into the water, but once they get out of the water, they have to dry off their feathers. And that's what this particular cormorant is doing. It's uh, drying off its feathers. And so uh, on this slide, you'll notice at the very top, it says double crested cormorant. And then in red, it has the Spanish name, which is cormorant bicrestado. And then it has the scientific name. And then in green, we have the locations where I've mostly seen these birds. This is a brown pelican, and this is an adult, so that's why it's so colorful. And uh, they're always begging for food, for fish, and this one was begging for uh, fish. But uh, very colorful birds, and uh, they have grebes, the smallest one being, well, actually not the smallest one. This is the eared grebe. And in Idaho, we get two grebes, the northern, the uh, horned grebe and the eared grebe. But in Baja, they only get the eared grebe. And it has a red eye. And you can see a pair of them in the water. And then their smallest one is the least grebe, much smaller, has a yellowish eye. And then we have the pied bill grebe. It's a very common grebe here in Idaho. And uh, also the Western Greek, not as common there, much more common here. In fact, uh, I'd say it's, it's our most common Greek. Now I'm gonna go through hawks, ospreys, and caracaras. And, and uh, this is the American kestrel, very common here. And it's actually a falcon. And I, all the falcons have this little mustache right here, as you'll see, right there too. So they primarily eat things like mice. And this is a Cooper's hawk, and they primarily eat birds. And we get Cooper's hawks here. He's getting ready to take off. And then uh, this is the, uh, their largest uh, falcon. And this is the falcon that is on the Idaho State Quarter. It's the Peregrine Falcon because the uh, Peregrine Fund has brought back this falcon from extinct, almost extinction. So there are only a couple hundred birds at one point due to DDT, which made their eggs too fragile and they would break. And so uh, to save the uh, falcons, they outlawed DDT in the United States, although it's still used in certain parts of the world. But uh, the peregrine falcon is actually spreading uh, throughout uh, North America, South America, and Europe. So it's made a phenomenal recovery. And uh, at, uh, this is uh, the, I'll call it the host peregrine falcon at uh, Hacienda Encantada. It nests down in the rocks. And a red-tailed hawk, that's our most common hawk here in Idaho. In fact, I'd say 40% of the hawks that we see here in Idaho are red-tailed hawks. And uh, this is actually a young red-tailed hawk. You'll notice the tail is not red. That's why it is young. When it becomes a, an adult, full adult, in a couple of years, the tail will turn red. And um, they also have uh, Northern Harriers, which are kind of a mix between, I think of them as a daytime owl, actually, because they have a very owl-like face and they always fly very close to the ground. And um, they're quite common here in Idaho. 
And then uh, this is the osprey. The Spanish word gavilan pescador means fish hawk. And its old name in English was fish hawk. And so they subsist primarily on fish. In fact, you can see this one on top of a dead, you can see the, the tail of the fish. So it's got a tail, uh, fish there, which it will eat. And um, this is a female and it's hard to make out, but right here, it, it'll have spots and it'll have what I would call a necklace. The male does not have the necklace. So you can tell a male from a female by the necklace. And then um, this is the crested caracara, which is very common in Mexico and in Baja California. But they're moving because of global warming. They're moving northward. I've seen them um, in Florida and in Texas. So they are moving north. And it's kind of a mix between a vulture and a uh, hawk because they eat dead animals. Another uh, caracara on the wing, actually a very attractive bird. This is a juvenile, so it's not as, quite as colorful. And then uh, this hawk is called the zone-tailed hawk and it's about the size of a vulture. And one of the unique characteristics of this particular hawk is that it will fly with vultures. So it will act like it's a vulture. And if you'll notice the back of the wing is very light, like a vulture, like a turkey vulture. And it has that one main stripe. And uh, so what it'll do is it'll be flying with the vultures and a rabbit or other small mammals will think it's a vulture and then it will dive and snatch it up. And so that's its kind of hunting characteristic. So uh, zone tail hawk, very attractive hawk. A very similar hawk is the common black hawk. But you'll notice that uh, the face is much uh, brighter. I'll back it up. You can see that on the Black Hawk, and it a, has a, a broad wing as well. This is the Black Hawk. And so it has uh, the white stripe much higher, and the bottom edge of the tail is white. So this is a common Black Hawk. And then they have Harris's Hawks. And uh, this one is very distinctive. He's, all brown and with the, his bottom down here is white. And these hawks hunt in groups. And so you'll see two or three of them uh, hunting. And sometimes the hawks, uh, if there's only one cactus, I've seen three hawks, one standing on top of the other. And then we have the turkey vulture. We get those here. And uh, again, I was able to get very close, but I'm using a telephoto lens. And again, they dry out their wings. Uh, actually, I don't think it's so much drying his wings as just cooling off because it gets quite hot down there. And so they kind of cool off this way. Now we're going to get into the gallinules. The American coot is very common here in Idaho. And uh, they have, uh, their toes are, uh, they don't have webbed feet, they have webbed toes. And then uh, a little bit smaller is the common gallino. Used to be called the common moorhen, but the common gallino, these are young ones, juveniles. And then this is the, uh, the adult. And the face of the adult always reminds me of candy corn, if you know what that is, because they have those two colors. And, and this is the common gallon, they're smaller. 
they also have a white butt. So you can tell them from the, um, I want to say the mud hen, the American coot. Growing up, we called them mud hens. Okay, now we're going to get into ducks. The, and there are two major kinds of ducks, the dabbling ducks and the diving ducks. The dabbling ducks have their legs in the middle of the body and they can walk on land. And the diving ducks have their legs toward the back of the body and they actually don't walk on land because it, it's just too hard. But it, by having their legs toward the back, they can propel themselves underwater. Okay? And uh, surprisingly enough, mallard ducks are not really common down there. But these are the ducks that we will see. And so we'll see the uh, American widgeon. That's the female. And uh, if you look at the tail, it's dark or black. And that's one way I just, if you see a duck with a black tail, it's probably going to be a, a gadwall or a, a American widgeon. And so this is the gadwall. Male and female. And uh, this is one on the wing. And then you'll see this little white patch here, which you can't see when it's, it's there. You can see it sort of right there, but um, normally can't see it. And then uh, the most common teal and they're kind of a mid-sized duck, is the blue-winged teal. And the way you can identify the male is by this white curved area in front of the eye. Okay, very distinctive. And this is the female. And uh, you look at the male's beak, it's like dark blue or gray. And so is the females. Not much uh, coloration, it's all dark bill. She's actually quiet. She has white between the bill and the eye as well. And so uh, and these are females, blueing teals. And then this is a cinnamon teal. They're also quite common, about the same size. And uh, for some reason, they like to get down in the mud. And you'll see them out there feeding. So these are one male with a bunch of females. And they look very similar to the, the females look very similar to the uh, blue wing tail. And then uh, one of the smallest ducks is actually the green wing teal. They're actually quite small. And uh, I think it's actually the smallest duck. But uh, distinctive red head with uh, this green band here. And then the side is very, uh, very fine looking. So it does when it flies, you can see the green wing. And then I think the most elegant of the ducks is a large dabbling duck called the Northern Pintail. And uh, we get those here, but I have never seen a Northern Pintail closer than 500 yards here in Idaho. They're always a long way off, primarily because we hunt them. Whereas you can see them much closer down in, in Baja because they're not being hunted. Very elegant bird. And here they are on the wing, uh, male and the females up here, and then the male in the back. And then one of my favorites is the northern shoveler. And it has a very broad curved bill. Now, I like this particular picture because you can see the curvature in the reflection on the water. And uh, these, these uh, northern shovelers actually have very small filaments inside their bill. And so what they're doing, what they do is they will feed right along the surface of the water and 
and pick up the small animals and, and plant life on the surface of the water. And so it's not unusual to see these, these uh, ducks actually feeding in a circular manner. They'll just, they'll, they'll be moving in a big circle. And uh, the northern shoveler male is actually a very beautiful bird. And so this is a uh, the male in uh, breeding plumage. I think they're beautiful birds. And uh, they are on the wing here. And uh, we get these birds as well. This is a lesser scop. Now the, we have two uh, ducks that are very similar. The ring neck duck and the lesser scop. The, the main difference is the, uh, this one doesn't have a ring on the bill. And there's not a white line right there. So this is a male lesser scop. And this is a female lesser scop, white on the front. No eye ring. And then uh, here are the uh, lesser scops. And usually a male always has one or two females with it. And then uh, get to the, this is the ring neck duck, but it has a ring on the bill. Personally, I think it should have been called the ring bill duck because you really cannot see the ring. When they named this duck, they looked at it. They looked, they were looking at a dead duck and they noticed that it had a dark brown ring on the neck. And that's why it was called the ring neck duck. This is the female. Looks just like the other, the lesser scop with the white. The main difference and a slight ring on the bill but the main difference is as a white eye ring where the scot does not. And so here you can see them and you can see uh, the female flying in flight and then make out the white eye ring. And then uh, redhead, I think they're pretty ducks. We see these here too in Idaho. Um, And then uh, the ruddy duck. Uh, sometimes they're called spine tails because they stick their tail up in the air. And uh, this is a male. And when it gets in breeding season, its bill will turn bright blue. And here it is with a spiny tail. And there's a whole family of spiny tail ducks. This female. Rails. The only one that I've seen is the uh, Sora. And we get these here too, as well. We get, we also get the Virginia rail, which is smaller. And then the Ibis, they have uh, the white Ibis. And the white faced Ibis. Now, I don't know why they named the white faced Ibis because some of them when they're adults have a little bit of white right there above the bill. And, but by and large in the field, you don't see the white face. Um, they do have a distinctive green wing. So now we're gonna get into the shorebirds. They're probably the toughest ones to identify and there are a lot of them. So we're going to zip through these fairly quickly. This is the uh, American Avocet. Um, and this one, uh, the Avocet has an upward pointing bill. Okay. And then its first cousin is the black neck stilt, which has a um, very straight bill. And of course, it's black. And um, its legs are very red. And so, and they're, they're very closely related. And then uh, the American oyster catcher. 
I don't think I've ever seen one in Idaho. Excuse me. But uh, they're common down there. And then uh, Wimbro, we don't get these in, this is more of an Eastern bird in, in the United States. And uh, one of the distinctive ways of identifying this bird is by looking at the top of the head. And so it has a little white line right there, dark head, two patches, and then white eyebrows. And so this is the Wimbro. And uh, what we do get is the long bill curlew and the bill is much longer. And so it's about three times the length of the head. So a lot of times you can't go out and measure one. So, so you look at the head size versus the bill size. And so this is the long bill curlew and they nest here in Idaho. And then uh, one of my favorites is the marble godwit. And it has a, uh, a quite long bill that is turned upward. There's a slight upward turn. And so the way I remember this is the bill turns toward God, hence God wit. So you can see that upward cur curvature. And then a willets, it's kind of an all gray bird. And uh, with the, the bill has a um, dark black point, very distinctive. But what makes this bird quite distinctive is when it flies. When it flies, you'll see this black and white wing pattern. It's the only one of these larger shorebirds that has this pattern. And then um, they also get Dowager, so do we here in Idaho. And like Idaho, Baja gets the short billed Dowagers and long billed Dowagers. And they're very hard to tell apart. But I identified these as long bill because the bill is twice as long as the head. Okay, so, and so the bill would be a little bit shorter on the short bill. And this is a lesser yellow legs. Note the yellow legs on it. And the bill is fairly fine, but about twice as long as the head. Now we have the greater yellow legs. The bill is much heavier and a bit, about two and a half times the length of the head. We also have a wandering tattler. Never seen one of those here in Idaho. And we do have killdeer, very common here in Idaho and they have them down there. And uh, these smaller peeps or plovers, I don't think we get. This is semi-palmated plover. They're generally coastal birds. And if you'll notice, I want you to pay attention to this very small bill. And uh, it's not only small, but it has a little bit of orange right there, okay? and yellow legs. And then this is a snowy plover, small bill. And then this is a Wilson's plover. The difference is they, they're a little more colorful here in the face and their bill is much larger, much larger bill. So, so they have a much longer bill if you can see it than the um, semi-palmated. So this is the Wilson's plover. And then a solitary sandpiper. And uh, they tend to be loners. And then uh, we get this bird, it's very similar, but smaller, and it's a spotted sandpiper. Now the way you tell this one from the solitary sandpiper, which look very much alike, is this one bobs its tail. And in Spanish, its name is alza colita, means pick up your butt. And so you'll see this bird bobbing its tail. And when they come to Idaho, they are spotted. 
whereas in Baja, they're not. You can kind of see a few spots back here. So it's starting to develop spots. And um, they'll, we'll find them here in the summertime, our summertime. We're there in Baja in the wintertime. And this is a bared sandpiper. And uh, this is our smallest peep of the, the sandpipers. The small ones are called peeps. And this is the uh, least sandpiper. And the way you can tell that one from the Western is it has yellow legs and this bill is thinner. So I want you to pay attention to that thinner bill, but they look very, very similar. And you'll see it in a minute. But we'll see another bird first called the sanderling, which is white with black very black legs. And then the Western sand, this is a Western sandpiper and the bill is heavier, much heavier than the least sandpiper and the legs are dark, not yellow. So they're darker, but not as bright yellow as the least. And uh, the wing pattern is slightly different. That's why I threw the, the wing pattern in. So now we're going to go into the herons and egrets. Uh, we get in Idaho. We have the black crown night heron, and uh, very common here, and very common down there as well. But we don't get the yellow crown night heron. And then uh, we do have the great blue heron. And notice that I've been listing where I see them. So. I cheated because this one is, I took on the Boise River and this great blue heron was eating a trout and that trout had to have been between 15 and 18 inches long. I mean, it was humongous. But it took him about half an hour to get that fish down his throat. So I was just totally blown away by how big a fish this great blue heron could swallow. Now, this is the largest of the herons in the heron family. And this is a great egret. We occasionally see these. They're more west, especially in Oregon. And um, one of the easy ways to tell this bird from some of the other white egrets is it is a large orange bill or yellowish orange and black legs and black feet, okay? And it's bigger. And uh, this one, you can't really make it out, but he has, he's captured a bird. It's got a bird in its bill. And this is a green heron. Now, this one here is all disturbed. He saw him. And so he raised the feathers on his head. And then, but I stood still and then he lowered the feathers. And this is what you'd normally see of the green heron. And I've never figured out why they call them green herons because they're mostly brown. I would have called it a brown heron. This is a little blue heron. And then a tricolored heron. So tricolored because of the blue and the brown and the white. And it's a medium sized heron. But it'll get right down and hunt. And this is a reddish egret. The reddish egret is an egret on steroids. They are like super active. <laughs> so if you see one, it'll be bouncing around. It's, and it won't sit still. And, um, and then uh, what we don't get here yet, but we eventually will, are the cattle egrets. And so cattle egrets are primarily around cows. And so they'll get up on the cow and eat the little flies and bugs on the cow and the bugs and flies on the cow poop. And they also will be around horses. And then this is a snowy egret. It's one of my favorites. Um, let me go back to the cattle egret. 
it has the yellow bill, kind of like the great egret. But uh, back up a more. Can't really see it on this one. But as they, um, as they, as these go into breeding, this part will get yellow, and the breast will become yellow. Whereas snow egret is all white, black bill, but it has these yellow clown's feet. I think I'm as clown's feet. They're yellow, and they'll actually put them in the water and use them as a lure. And they'll twirl a foot in the water, and it'll, for some reason, a fish will be attracted by that yellow movement, and will come to look, and then whack, they get eaten. <laughs> wow. Okay, so we're gonna zip through a bunch of gulls, mostly the, the first, the young, small ones. This is a Franklin's gull, uh, black bills, bone apart, not as sharp of a bill. And then the lapping gull, and this one you can really tell by its call because it sounds like it's a laugh and its legs are, are also uh, lighter colored. And then the Hearman's gull, which is a coastal bird, we see them in Oregon, and they're kind of an all gray bird, a very dark gull. And then uh, California gull, we get these here as well in Idaho. In fact, 75% uh, of the California gulls breed in the Great Salt Lake. Personally, I think they should have been called the Utah gull, not the California gull. And one of its distinctive marks is this little red point right there. Now, when they have chicks, the chick will tap the adult right there on that red spot. And then the adult will open its mouth and the chick will then go into the adult mouth and feed. And it has kind of yellowish legs. And then uh, this is uh, our most common gull here in Idaho is the ring bill gull. You see the ring right there? And uh, they're a much lighter gull. And in the background is a gull that is unique to Baja California, north and south. And it's a yellow footed gull, but you can see the size difference, much bigger gull. And uh, on our coast, and we sometimes get them here, uh, are the Western gulls. They're a bit bigger than the California gull. Of course, when they're in the air, they're kind of hard to tell apart. But one of the ways you can tell them apart is by their pink feet. They have pink feet. They're a bit bigger than the California gull. And the point of the bill is bulkier and is lighter in color but you really have to get into gulls to, to tell the difference. I mean, this is a Western gull and um, you can kind of see the pink feet. And then this is their biggest gull, the yellow footed gull. It definitely has yellow feet. Beautiful bird. And then uh, now we're moving into turns. This is the largest turn in the world, it's a Caspian turn. Bright orange bill with um, a black tip, but the very, very tip is orange. So it has a kind of a black ring there. And it's definitely a, a big gull, a turn, almost the size of a gull. And so, uh, and then uh, this turn, with the yellow bill is a, uh, an elegant turn, okay? So elegant turns. And um, it kind of a yellow spill. And then the royal turn. The yellow, New York royal turn actually is almost the same size as the um, Caspian turn. Not quite as big, but it doesn't have the black tip. Royal turn. And then of course, California quail are very common down there. So they must have moved right straight down the coast because if you get over into um, 
Arizona, you don't find California quail. And now get into woodpeckers. They have a very small ladder back woodpecker. Occasionally we see this here in Idaho and in Oregon. Very distinctive. But their most common woodpecker is the Gila woodpecker. And this one is a male, it has little red pop marks here. And this is a female Gila woodpecker on cacti. It's amazing that they can, you look at all those spines on that cacti, it's like, how can you stand on that cacti? But they do. And then they have a more elegant woodpecker called the golden flicker. Very similar to our flicker and it has a black bib, but it has a, um, a um, orange cap. So this is the gilded, I, I might've said golden, it's the gilded flicker. And then the underside here is also golden. And so gilded flicker, and you can see the underside of the tail with a golden color. And then the male has this little red right there that the female does not, okay? Now, uh, there's one little sparrow-like bird they have down there, and it's the American pipit. The way you can tell a pipit from a sparrow is sparrows hop, and pipits run. They don't hop. So this is a little pipit and it has a stripe, its breast is striated. But half of the sparrows have striated breasts as well. So now we're gonna get into flycatchers. And uh, my favorite happens to be the ash-throated flycatcher. And for cuteness, I would go with the gnat catchers. So this is the ash-throated flycatcher. Has a little brown in the tail and on the side of the wing. And it has kind of a yellow belly, but a white throat and breast. So you can see the white throat and breast. And then the brown in the tail. This is the ash-throated flycatcher. I've actually seen one here in Boise. And had I not seen them in Baja, I would have never known what the bird was. But this is the ash-throated flycatcher. They're very common down there. And uh, we also get the black phoebe in Idaho. And this is a flycatcher. And then the Cassin's kingbird. Um, the one that we have here in Idaho is the western kingbird. And the difference is the western kingbird has a white feather on each side of the tail. Otherwise, they're indistinguishable. You have to look at the tail. And this is a Pacific Slope flycatcher. You'd see this more in Oregon than in Idaho. Middle. And one of my favorites, Vermilion flycatcher. They're very common in Arizona. And this is a male. And then uh, this is a Western wood peewee. And we have these in Idaho. And the willow flycatcher, a smaller, uh, and pitonax, whole family of those. And then now the gnat catcher, it's a tiny little bird, super active. And uh, its Spanish name is common, Pearl. But uh, the blue has a uh, white eye ring. It's, it's kind of blue gray, white breast, and the top of the tail is black. And the California gnat catcher has a black cap, and the back of the tail is, is black, and the underside of the tail is different. And uh, its underside is grayer, no white. Blue gray gnat catcher. 
and then doves. And this is the common ground dove. It's the most common ground. It's the most common of the ground doves in Baja. And uh, the way you can tell it apart from the ruddy is by the bill. If you notice that the, the part near the, the head is kind of reddish, and then has a dark point. That's the primary way. And it has kind of a scaled look here when it's in breeding. Now this is a ruddy ground up. You see why it's called ruddy. Uh, most common pigeon is the uh, rock dove or rock pigeon. And we get those here. All you have to do is go to downtown Boise. And they, they don't have uh, morning doves, but their common wild dove is the white wing dove. And so very, very common dove, white wing dove. And, but like the, you notice this blue around the eye there? Our uh, morning doves also have that kind of bluish characteristic. We see one up close. So now we're gonna get into the buntings. This is a, a young female Lazuli bunting. We, when we see them in Idaho, uh, if we see them, they're blue. They're in breeding form. This is a house finch, female house finch. And this is a purple finch. It's more of a coastal finch. And we do get lesser goldfinch. Uh, where I primarily see these are wherever you have wild sunflowers. They like sunflowers. Lesser goldfinch. And then the house sparrow. This is a female or young, I'm sorry, this is a young adult. A young male. But uh, so those are young males and that's an adult house sparrow. Most people know what a house sparrow looks like. And then uh, the female house sparrow actually is kind of pretty. Lighter bill and has this eye line. And then uh, one of the prettiest sp uh, sparrows, I think, are, are the lark sparrows. I've never seen one in Boise, but if you go east of here, uh, along uh, Black's Creek or the road to Prairie, you'll, they're quite common. So this is a lark sparrow. I've seen them east of Boise, never in Boise. Lark sparrow. And then uh, we see these. These are, this is a Savannah sparrow, very distinctive yellow eyebrow, okay? And if you'll notice, its breast also has lines. Okay, another one. Now this one I threw in because this particular Savannah Sparrow developed these two uh, black feathers right here. And they look like eyes. And so I think that's a de uh, defensive uh, development, so that if a bird came from behind, they would think that that's a bird looking at them with the eyes. And so it wouldn't surprise me to see more of these in the future, because I think it's a survival technique. I know I'm getting a bit detailed on the sparrow, but and one of the my favorite sparrows is white clown sparrow. It's a much larger sparrow. You'll notice it has a bare breast, no stripes. It has that distinctive white crown. And uh, they come through in the spring and the fall. They're, a migratory. They're migratory for us. And this is a uh, canyon towhee. I only saw one. I've never seen another one. But they're a larger sparrow. Now we'll get into my, one of my favorite birds which is a desert bird and it's the burden. And it's Spanish name, baloncita means little ball. Cause it's just a little fluff ball. But it has a little red shoulder patch. Okay, on each shoulder. 
and it uh, has an all yellow head, and the rest of it is gray. But a lot of times when you're looking at it, you can't actually make out the red spot or the, or the yellow head, because it for some reason tends to blend in. But um, I believe this is uh, Bougainvillea. And so I, I just thought, catching this one here, thought this would have made a good, great Christmas card. So this is the Verdon, one of my favorite desert birds. Now this is a, uh, a very good picture of the Belding's yellowthroat, which is a warbler. But the, this part here is yellow on the Belding's. And it's actually bigger than the common yellowthroat, which you'll see here. The common yellowthroat we do have in Idaho, and, but this part is white. Okay. It has white eyebrow. And that's the main difference. This is a Wilson's warbler, and it has that black bishop's cap. And then a yellow rump warbler. Okay, I'm actually doing very well for time. Because believe it or not, I have something like 300 slides. So the yellow rumped warbler has yellow on its throat. There's yellow right here below the wing on its flank. And then it has a yellow rump. Okay. And in Idaho, we call them butter butts because of that yellow rump. Now we're going to go into Orioles. They have three species of Oriole. We only have one. Okay. And uh, this one is the hooded oriole, which has an all yellow head and a black throat. So black goes right up to the eye and down, down the throat. It, it, this is continuous through the back, the yellow is. So hooded oriole, male. This is the female. And uh, I was looking at the bill as a longer bill. And then um, the orchard oriole is orange with a black head, much darker and smaller. It's small, smaller, much smaller than. And this is the female orchard oriole. And then this is the Scots oriole. The Scots oriole has an all black head. And the coloring is not, I've only seen two or three of these, but this is all yellow. It's, it's a yellow, bright yellow um, oriole. So this is again, the Scots oriole. So you can see the yellow and it's as big as the hooded oriole. Now the Cardinals. So um, this is the male Northern Cardinal. Very pretty bird. And this is the female. And this is a female who looked kind of scraggly, but it was flying. It just ugh, had a, a bad hair day. And then they have a one that looks very similar to a cardinal called the pyroluxia that you see primarily in the desert. But the bill is much thicker. Look at that bill. I'm going to go back to the bill of the cardinal. See how that's more pointed? Now look at that bill. That bill is very different. It's all gray. And uh, it does, does have a little top notch there. And then um, they do have uh, black headed grosbeak. And we get those here as well. By the way, we don't get the cardinals. I've never seen one here. And then uh, blue grosbeak. This, these are young, this is a young blue grosbeak. Uh, in Arizona, I've seen in breeding season, this grosbeak will, will turn all blue. And it will truly be a blue grosbeak. But all we're seeing is the blue face at this point. So this is a juvenile. 
but it's the only blue grove speak that I've seen. And it was actually at the Hacienda in Cantara, which really surprised me. And um, this is probably my favorite wren. It's one of the largest wrens, if not the largest wren. It's the cactus wren, has a very distinctive call. Now, I should have recorded this, but in a lot of uh, Western movies, they will play, you know, as a sound filler, they'll play the call of the Western or the cactus wren, but you'll see it in uh, like a pine forest. And this bird is in a scrub forest or in cactus, never in, in uh, I'm around pine trees or junipers or anything like that. It's, so it just seems weird that they would uh, play the sound of a cactus plant. But again, they like cacti. And you can see they, those cacti are very spiny and yet there it is standing on top of this cactus. And here's a uh, Northern Mockingbird. Uh, I've actually seen one in Idaho. So they're moving northward too. Beautiful bird. And the uh, Northern Mockingbird is known for mimicking. So it will mimic a lot of other birds. So you'll hear a lot of these mimicking um, or a lot of bird calls. And you'll think there are a lot of different birds around. And it's actually the Mockingbird. Uh, calling out bird songs that it's learned from other birds. And then uh, this is the California scrub jay. It was um, recently split. So we have an interior scrub jay. We do not get the California scrub jay. It's a coastal bird. Okay, and I just pulled a blank on the, uh, the interior scrub jay. But um, this is the California scrub jay and it has a uh, smaller back, a gray back, but it's much smaller. Whereas the interior one is, is duller looking. Okay, so again, uh, California scrub jay. And then uh, this is a common raven. And if you notice, this was actually taken from the patio of our hotel room. And Lisa has this very bad habit of feeding birds. And so she threw out these uh, <laughs> and, stuff. Oh my and yeah. Raven came over and scarfed them up. You can see it picking up some of the food. Now the advantage to it was I was able to get some very good close-up shots of the raven. So it's much bigger than a crow, but it was there. And uh, actually I have a picture of Lisa feeding a gull. I mean, hand feeding a gull, but I decided not to show that one. But this is a common raven. And this is it. We went through this pretty quickly. And um, the last time, uh, it's common to see um, California gray whales from the, um, from where we, the uh, Sassian in Cantada, because it's, the hotel is built on a place called Ballena Point. And the whales come and they, I guess they, they scratch off any um, things that grow on their skin. And so they kind of cleanse themselves by rubbing against the rocks right there by our hotel. And so we can actually watch whales with our binoculars from our room, which is kind of mind boggling. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, we still have gone out on whale oh. trips. You have a question from uh, one of the um, members here. Yes. And, uh, the question is, are there any bird species in which the female is more colorful 
than the male. Yes, there are, but not in Baja. The, uh, the most colorful one would be the um, Wilson Spallero. Wilson Spallero, and I don't have a picture of them because they don't occur down there, but they do occur here in Idaho. And, um, and in fact, uh, where I've seen them is at the um, water treatment plant in Cuna and in a little reservoir by Ola, Ola, Idaho, which is north of North America. And the female is very colorful and the male is very drab. And the reason that the female is colorful is that she will mate with the male lay the eggs, and then the male sits on the nest and, and hatches the babies. And she will go out and find another male and, Good for her. <laughs> and have another batch. <laughs> and so she might, uh, she might breed it three times in a year in the summertime. Wow. But they're very attractive birds, the Wilson's Fowlerow. And uh, it's a water bird, but uh, they are, uh, what's the word uh, where, you, where you stay with one partner? Monog Mon monogamous? Monogamous, thank you. They're not monogamous. <laughs> <laughs> they are definitely polygamous. I ought to know that, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, there's another uh, question from uh, Sheena Smith. What is the rarest bird uh, you ha uh, photo you have taken? Okay. Uh, would that be the resplendent quetzal or? It probably would be the resplendent quetzal. Now I do have uh, what I call a nemesis bird, a bird that I have not seen or photographed in Baja. And that nemesis bird is none other than the road runner. Road runners are common in Baja. I've never seen one. We've been there 10 years in a row. And believe it or not, I have pictures of road runners from Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, and California. <laughs> and so I've got pictures of road runners throughout the Southwest. <clears throat> but not in Baja. And, and so it's, I have a birding buddy down there. And so it's become a joke that we go looking for the road runner and we never find it. So uh, one other question is how close to Los Barriles is uh, Los Cabos? I'd say 20 miles. Okay. and. Uh, you know, the, the picture that I showed you, uh, I can go to the very end. Let's see. Maybe I should just redo this. See if I can start this back up again. Show you the map. Uh, Los Barriles actually uh, is kind of interesting community. Because, okay, here's San Jose and Los Barriles is right here. It might be 25 miles. But this community is primarily uh, populated by Canadians. There are as many Canadians in Baja as there are Americans. And so, that is one thing, when you go to Baja, Cabo, San Lucas, San Jose, or to Los Barriles, probably the most common language is English because of all these expats that have moved down there. And so, but Los Barriles is more uh, isolated. And so, like the main grocery stores would actually be in La Paz or San Jose del Cabo or Cabo San Lucas. And when you fly in, 
you fly in to the airport, which is called Los Cabos, which is here. And then you take a, a freeway or a toll road, which uh, this one, this map doesn't show it, but there's a toll road that brings you into San Jose or it shoots straight across to Cabo San Lucas. And so, um, but now the road today from here all the way around to La Paz is, is freeway. But this road is two lane road and mountains because you're going over the mountain range. But Los Barriles is uh, actually a very interesting place to go to. And the food is great. I especially like their fish tacos. In fact, when we get off the plane, first thing we do is go over to a place called Junior's and have fish tacos in San Jose del Cabo. Got to have our fish tacos before we even go to uh, Punta Ballena or to Hacienda Encantada, which is right about here. So uh, let me ask if there are any more questions from our audience, from our participants, any last questions? Uh, you can unmute your microphone and ask them directly if you have any questions. So uh, I guess we have no more questions. Uh, so I wanna thank everyone for uh, attending our session today and Thank you so much to uh, Steve Ledbetter for uh, hosting the session. And uh, just a reminder that the survey that we wish you to, uh, uh, to um, answer for us is uh, in your chat box. And Steve is now posting it uh, on the screen. And so, uh, Thank you, Steve, for doing that. Uh, once again, your input is much appreciated. It will help us with future classes. And I want to thank our presenter, Alexander Sapiens, for uh, sharing his uh, uh, photos and, and his insights on, on birds. And um, as we know, uh, birds are harbingers of our of, of our ecosystem and uh, birds are very important to observe and watch. Not only are they beautiful, but they also uh, are uh, indicative of how healthy our e ecology and our planet is. So it's um, kind of a fun thing to get to be familiar with birds. So thank you, Alexander Sapiens. Thank you, Steve Ledbetter. And thank you all for participating today.